So they cut off fuel and ammunition for the whole army. And in return, they not let them use the rail system or local communications. Wait, wait a second. Aren't they supposed to be called the Allies? Huh? Wait till I hear about Montgomery. Okay, shoot. Hello? Hello? <sighs> January 6, 1945. This war went global in 1939 and has but grown and grown over the first half of the decade of the 1940s. Now the second half of that decade begins with the death toll by now in the tens of millions. Welcome to 1945. I'm Indy Nidell. This is World War II. Last week in the Battle of the Bulge, the Allies broke the Siege of Bastogne and the German offensive still failed to reach its goals. There were issues between British Field Marshal Bernard Montgomery and American Command, the major fighting in Leyte ended, and the Red Army surrounded Budapest and put it under siege. Now, on the 31st, the Hungarian Provisional Government, in the parts of Hungary cleared by the Soviets, declares war on Germany. This week comes a German counterattack to try to relieve the siege by, in part, those SS Panzers diverted from Army Group Center last week. This is 4th SS Panzer Corps I'm talking about under Herbert Gille, and their transferal and attack is Operation Conrad. They arrive at the German base at Komarno and make a southeastern thrust towards Bichke and Budapest, hitting 31st Guards Rifle Corps hard at 10.30 p.m. January 1st. They even have a bit of Luftwaffe support for a change, and over the next couple of days, make it to Bitschke and to just a few dozen kilometers away from the Germans defending in Buda. The Soviets under attack are part of Fyodor Tolbukhin's third Ukrainian front, and so to take off some pressure on them, on the 4th, Stavka orders Rodion Malinovsky's second Ukrainian front to hit Komarno itself. This would go into the rear of the 4th SS Panzers. Tolbukhin also has orders to send some of his other units towards Komarno to try to encircle the Panzer Corps. Early this morning, the 6th, Malinovsky attacks from the River Hron Line, and they set up a bridgehead on the western bank by the middle of the day. But in the evening, the Germans attack along the Danube and retake Estergom, while also blocking any advance from the Hron bridgehead. There is heavy fighting between Hron and Nitra rivers, but the Soviets are stopped as the week ends as for the fighting in Budapest itself. Last week, the Soviets took Buda Kalash in northern Buda and Buda Fok in the south. The Lagimanios railway embankment is an example of the kind of defenses the Germans have in the city, though. The roads passing beneath the railway lines were protected with AA guns, and the bridges later were blown up, making the roads impassable. The embankment itself was laid with mines, a line of fire trenches was established, and dense barbed wire was spread in three rows. Behind the wire barriers, machine gun nests were established at eight strong points along the length of the embankment. A covered and camouflaged trench connected the embankment to the buildings behind, which were filled with troops and machine gun nests. These houses formed the second line of defense. The flat, unprotected area north of the embankment had only a few buildings. If the Soviets broke through the embankment, they would be exposed to fire in this open area from the second line machine guns. But they ground out gains in Buda all last week. In Pest, they broke the Attila 1 and 2 lines, so Karl Pfeffer Wildenbruch, running the city defenses, pulled back to the Attila 3 line to shorten his defense lines. By this week, the defenses of the Buda bridgehead are now solid and are based on several strong points. That embankment, Schmidt Castle, Fakasreti Cemetery, and Sas Hill. In Pest, though, the Romanians reached the Rakos Creek line. The Attila third line is broken, and the Soviets take like 200 city blocks on the first. Over the next few days, the defenses stiffen. Though the last two days of the week, the Soviets and Romanians take around 400 more blocks of the city. And deep thrusts in Pest have caused the Germans to pull back even further, since the front lines just cannot be defended. OKH Chief of Staff Heinz Guderian is worried. 
On the 5th, he visits Army Group South headquarters. Then today, heads north to Army Group A headquarters. This is not just an inspection tour. He is quite concerned because the Budapest relief operation is taking way too long. And contrary to all that Hitler has said, Guderian still expects a massive offensive to hit Army Groups A and Center sometime in the middle of the month. Okay, what does Army Group A think of that? It turns out they have a plan that they present to Guderian when he arrives in Krakow. It is not a plan full of positives. When they lost reserve divisions to Army Group South recently, their chief of staff ran a war game which showed the Russians could break through and reach the Silesian border in six days, and that they could be stopped on the Oder was by no means certain. A subsequent study showed that the most the Army Group could do was to give itself what might be a fighting chance. That would involve pulling back to the Hubertus Line two nights before the enemy offensive began. This line is parallel to the Baranov bridgehead on the Vistula, just around eight or nine kilometers back, and runs straight north up to the western end of the Magnushev bridgehead. Pulling back would hopefully prevent parts of 4th Panzer and 9th Armies from being encircled once the attacks begin, would shorten the front, and would actually give them some reserves. Guderian reviews the plan, and two days from now will approve it. It is not very likely, though, that Hitler will also approve it. There is some growing tension between them. Last week, I went over the growing tensions between British Field Marshal Bernard Montgomery and American Command in the West, which culminated with Monty writing a letter to Allied Supreme Commander Dwight Eisenhower saying, One commander must have powers to direct and control the operation. You cannot possibly do it yourself, and so you would have to nominate someone else. Monty encloses with the letter a proposed order, oh yes, for Eisenhower to issue to both 12th and 21st Army Groups that full operational control rests with the commander of the 21st, Bernard Montgomery. This letter arrives just before a message from U.S. Army Chief of Staff George Marshall that there are London papers calling for Monty to run all Allied ground forces. Eisenhower is furious, and his fury only grows when he finds out from Monty's Chief of Staff Freddy de Guingand that no offensive against the Bulge will be launched from the northern end, Monty's end, until the 3rd. This prompts Ike, Eisenhower, to say that he's going to write to the Joint Chiefs that either he or Montgomery has to go. Freddie asks if he can please hold off on that until tomorrow, the 31st, and Ike says, okay, tomorrow. So, Freddie rushes to see Monty and tells him that if he keeps up with this, one of them will have to go, and it's not going to be Eisenhower. Montgomery asks, who will replace me? De Guingan says they already know who that would be, Harold Alexander. This deflates Montgomery, and so he signs an apology note that de Guingan has already drafted. So things quiet down on that front until near the end of the week. More on that in a moment, for a new crisis emerges first. Another new German offensive, Operation Nordwind, kicks off on New Year's Day in Alsace. This is against Jake Devers' 6th Army Group, who currently have the twin tasks of backing up Omar Bradley's 12th Army Group flanks and eliminating the enemy's Colmar Pocket. The Colmar Pocket, as wide as the bulge in Belgium and about half as deep, also proved unyielding. General Dahlquist's 36th Division, attached to Delatre's 1st French Army, reported that their French brothers-in-arms showed little interest in completing the liberation of Alsace, even as German forces aggressively shored up the salient. Squabbling between rival French factions persisted, aggravated by General Leclerc's declaration that neither he nor his 2nd Armored Division cared to serve under a Vichy traitor like Delatre. I now have two problem children, Leclerc and De La Tre, Devers wrote, General Marshall. Thing is, though, back on December 26, Eisenhower announced plans for the Franco-American force to pull back to the Vosges, giving up Strasbourg. Devers protested, but Eisenhower said he had to until the Ardennes fight is over. Devers wrote that this would be a political disaster for France, and French head of state Charles de Gaulle called Alphonse Juin, French army chief of staff, the 28th, 
about rumors to this effect, and Juan warned de Gaulle, they're up to something. Devers moved his command post back to Vittel, but made several plans for intermediate withdrawals, while de la Trey ordered his subordinates to not give up a centimeter of Alsace. As this week begins, Devers tells Eisenhower that withdrawal could take two weeks. Eisenhower then gives him the concrete order to move now. Well, an order is an order. Although, on the 31st, recon spots German artillery moving up, and so Alexander Patch's 7th Army is put on alert instead of moving. The Germans do indeed attack them that night. Johannes Blaskowitz is again running Army Group G since December 24th, and this operation is to penetrate into the rear of U.S. 7th Army and surround it and French 1st Army. The plan is for eight divisions to move southwest, retake the Saverne Gap, and link up with the 19th Army in the Colmar Pocket. In addition, the attack would force Patton to withdraw from Bastogne to parry this new threat. French troops in Alsace were weak and disorganized, the Fuhrer promised, and the U.S. 7th Army was overextended along a 126-mile perimeter. Those last are both kind of true, but 7th Army is also on the alert, and they're well dug in. The attacks begin at half past midnight, and over the first two days of 1945, make minimal gains and create a lot of dead German bodies. With the ground covered in most areas with a foot of snow, it took the German units some time to move up to the front lines. More often than not, American accounts recall that the German soldiers attacked drunk, screaming and shouting as they advanced into their fire. In fact, 7th Army Chief of Staff Arthur White writes in his diary, German offensive began on 7th Army front about 12.30 a.m. Krauts were howling drunk, murdered them. Another attack, the first though, a bit to the east by 6th SS Mountain Division below Bitsche, does bend 7th Army lines, getting as far as vignen sur moder by the 4th and could maybe threaten Strasbourg 50 kilometers to the southeast. On the 2nd, de Gaulle tells de la Troye to not abandon Strasbourg no matter what, but Devers writes to de la Troye to pull back from Strasbourg to the Vosges no later than the 5th. Juan appeals to Beadle Smith, Eisenhower's chief of staff, and on the 3rd there's a big meeting about it, and by that afternoon, Eisenhower realizes they're going to have to try to hold Strasbourg for the sake of Allied unity. Eisenhower does meet with de Gaulle anyhow, and both sides make a few digs. Ike says that if the French choose to fight independently, that he would suspend fuel and ammunition supplies to the French army. De Gaulle points out that, in that case, the French would forbid the American use of their railways and communication networks. Tonight, though, the Germans are forced from Vingen, and its recapture by the Allies is the end of the first phase of Nordwind. A senior staff officer visiting Blaskowitz's headquarters today makes an assessment of the operation so far. The evident waning fighting strength of our own troops is explicable not only by the brevity and insufficiency of training time together in the reserve army, but also the absence of old, reliable NCOs and competent battalion and company officers. A prerequisite for any new assault would be personnel replacements. Also, the artillery has proven to be insufficient. Likewise, it's forward observers and their radio equipment. As for shifting around command and control, on the 5th, Schaefe confirms news reports that U.S. 1st and 9th Armies are now under British command, which they have temporarily been for a couple weeks. London papers call them Monty's troops, though, and they, too, ask for a chain of command under one man, Montgomery. Today, the 6th, Montgomery tells Winston Churchill he's going to hold a press conference tomorrow, the 7th, to explain how they've won the Ardennes campaign and to debunk any suggestion of American failures there. Monty's intelligence officer, Edgar Williams, hears of this and offers two words of advice. Please don't. And this is quite a good line from Rick Atkinson. Others in his headquarters, smelling condescension, also sought to dissuade him. I like that. Even war correspondent Alan Moorhead, whose books I used in writing this series, asks de Guingan to stop Montgomery from holding the press conference in case he makes a horrible mistake. 
The Guingan says, that's a funny attitude for a newsman to have. And Moorhead replies, I want to win the war. We'll see what happens next week. The fighting in the Ardennes is not actually over, by the way. Both German panzer armies are now on the defensive, sure, but still, as of this week, they have 20 infantry and 8 panzer divisions there, and it's still going to be a hard fight to get them out of there. On the 31st, British 30th Corps takes Rochefort at the western end of the Ardennes salient. On the 1st, Operation Bodenplatte, base plate, is launched by the Luftwaffe against Allied air bases in northern France, Belgium, and the Netherlands. 900 German planes hit more than 20 airfields, destroying 150 Allied planes and damaging 110 more, but having 300 of their own shot down. Not just by the Allies, but by their own AA guns, since to preserve secrecy, the AA units have not been told of the operation. So they lose a great many pilots killed or captured. While the Allies could replace most of their pilots and aircraft quite easily, however, the shooting down of German aircraft struck at the very heart of the Luftwaffe. The majority of its fighters had been concentrated for use in Wacht am Rhein and Bodenplatte, which left the front at home extremely vulnerable. Germany was now more powerless than ever to resist the waves of Allied bombers. On the 2nd, U.S. 3rd Army forces take Bonnaroo, Ubermont, and Remagne near Ufalis. German Army Group Commander Walter Model and Panzer Army Commander Hasso von Manteuffel request to withdraw from west of Ufalis, but Hitler says no. The 3rd Army offensive is launched on the 1st, and is done so because they believe Montgomery is going to launch his offensive from the north to pinch the bulge that same day. He does not do this until the 3rd, though. Remember half a year ago when Hitler said that if the Allies landed anywhere in France, the Reich would lose the war? Well, still trying and trying to turn the tide there, though, so the fight continues. And to be fair, Patton thought Third Army would reach Ufalis in a one-day jump of 30 or so kilometers, but he's averaging about one and a half per day. Monty's offensive from the north is not moving any faster either, so it really will continue. One other thing to cover on that front. On the 1st comes the Chenon Massacre, where the U.S. 11th Armored Division machine guns some 80 German POWs in the field. This is in retaliation for the Malmedy Massacre the other week, which was Germans machine gunning American prisoners. So the Battle of the Bulge may not be winding down yet, but other battles are. I've talked about the fighting in Italy winding down, but now on the 2nd, in a conference with his commanders, Mark Clark, Richard McCreary, and Lucian Truscott, Mediterranean commander Harold Alexander calls a halt to the Italian operations for the winter. British 8th and US 5th armies do then carry out limited operations to consolidate their fronts. And on Leyte in the Philippines, though the battle is largely over, there are still scattered but vicious counterattacks in the Northwest. Japanese casualties for the battle are over 50,000 and perhaps as many as 65,000 mostly killed. The Americans took 15,000 killed and wounded. U.S. 8th Army is now taking 6th Army's place on Leyte as 6 will hit Luzon next week. The 3rd and 4th, three carrier groups from U.S. 3rd Fleet attack targets on Formosa and the southern Ryukyus. The weather is bad, so the attacks aren't all that effective, but they take out 100 Japanese planes for the loss of around 20 of their own. This is actually related to the coming Allied landings on Luzon. See, what they're hitting are planes that are eventually bound for Luzon. The 2nd to the 5th, all of the shipping, the transports, escort carriers, bombardment force for the Luzon landings leaves from Leyte bases. Six battleships, 18 escort carriers, a half dozen cruisers, and loads of smaller ships is the total force. These are sent out in groups. Minesweepers first, escort carriers and destroyers screen next, gunships next, with the troop transports last, so they're held back from any kamikaze attacks as long as possible. They also have escort carriers with them. The Japanese detect all this from the third 
and attack with kamikazes, midget submarines, and small surface ships. The escort carriers are the main allied protection against kamikazes and have airborne defense up all day long. Still, on the 4th, a kamikaze attack crashes through the flight and hangar decks of escort carrier Omani Bay, causing 158 casualties and damaging the ship badly enough that she has to be abandoned and sunk. Similar such attacks, the fifth damaged two cruisers, two escort carriers, and some smaller ships. Actually, cruiser Boise, which has Douglas MacArthur aboard, narrowly escapes a torpedo attack that day. On the 6th, Jesse Oldendorf's battleship group enters Lingayen Gulf for the preliminary bombardment and comes under heavy attack. A minesweeper is sunk and two battleships, four cruisers, and six destroyers are damaged since, once in the Gulf, there's not so much room to maneuver. The 6th and 7th, the fleet carrier groups from 3rd Fleet join the operations against the kamikaze airfields on Luzon, being carried out by escort carrier planes and land-based ones from Leyte. And here are a few notes to end the week. On the 2nd, Admiral Bertram Ramsey, naval chief of all Allied forces in Europe, is killed in an air accident en route to meet Montgomery. Ice on the wings and a pilot error during takeoff cause a crash 8 kilometers south of Versailles. On the 5th, the Soviets announce that they recognize the Lublin Committee as the Polish Provisional Government. The U.S. and Britain announce that they still recognize the Polish government in exile in London. That same day in Athens, the fighting between the British and Iam ends. Harold Alexander and British reps arrive in Athens for more talks. On the 6th, Winston Churchill asks Joseph Stalin if the Soviets can go over to their offensive in Poland earlier than planned to relieve pressure in the Ardennes. Stalin says, sure, no problem. And the week ends with fierce fighting in and around Budapest, a new German offensive in France, the one in Belgium continuing, issues threatening the unity of Allied command, and the Allies gearing up to land on Luzon. You know what? Over the autumn, German command asked for combat condition reports from the various army groups. As you might guess, what everyone said they wanted most were replacement troops. Also, they reported that the troop morale was affected by the recent losses of pre-war German territory in the West and in East Prussia and by the terror bombing. The general attitude of the troops was still confident, but for the great majority, the confidence was grounded exclusively on the hope that soon new weapons would appear which could stop the air raids and break the enemy ground superiority. How deeply in trouble Germany was, Hitler knew better than the poor Lancers and Grenadiers who still believed in secret weapons. Already December 28th, Hitler meets with the generals of the divisions who were to open the Alsace Offensive on New Year's Day. He admits that the Ardennes Offensive has failed and that in 1945, Germany would be fighting for its mere existence. He then says this, I would like to interpose immediately, gentlemen, when I say that you should not infer that I am thinking of losing the war even in the slightest. I have never in my life learned the meaning of the word capitulation, and I am one of those men who has worked his way up from nothing. For me, therefore, the circumstances in which we find ourselves today are nothing new. That is quoted in Earl Zimke's Stalingrad to Berlin. But Zimke points out something important. Hitler's given many such speeches before, sure. Most recently, just before the Ardennes Offensive three weeks ago. But even then, and always before, there has always been a political and strategic element to his speeches. Like he talks about his iron will, but that it will achieve specific objectives or strategies. Now, it is only his will that matters, and battles are secondary things. He goes on to tell the generals that he will not weaken. And that's all that counts. That's what will win or lose the war. And he then reminds them of the miracle of the House of Brandenburg after Frederick the Great lost the Seven Years' War, but got back all his lost territory and even some more land when the coalition against him fell apart. Zimke ends that section with this. Hundreds of thousands were to die while Hitler awaited the second such miracle. 
One miracle we covered a few years ago that happened a couple decades before this war, but had serious ramifications for it, was the miracle on the Vistula. If you don't know what that is, or even if you do, go check out this episode from Between Two Wars that covers the Polish-Soviet War. You will be glad that you did. It'll come up there any second now. And this series and that series are brought to you by the Time Ghost Army. You can join the army at timeghost.tv or patreon.com. These are the newest commissioned officers, and the army member of the week is Robin Pagan. Do not forget to subscribe. See you next time.